I would like to wish a good afternoon and a good evening to all the colleagues that uh, managed to participate to this webinar. Uh, for introduction, I would like to say that, um, I would like, first of all, to thank you for taking time to participate at this webinar. And this uh, webinar is organized by the APHRC. Uh, it, there's also a WHO. There's also the team of the World Study on, um, on Adolescents. And also we have uh, the John Hopkins School and also the Center Interstate of Brazzaville. Uh, these partners decided to organize a series of webinars so, uh, so that we can have uh, learning and uh, exchange for the study about uh, adolescents and also the various uh, relevant tools and all that it will be in uh, French. The first webinar uh, that will uh, take place today will be about gender and uh, sexual and reproductive health of adolescents. So without wasting any time, uh, I'm going to present to you the different panelists the colleagues that are going to moderate this webinar. I'm going to, to talk about the here about uh, three colleagues. We have Anna that we are going to welcome us. I'm going to introduce her later on. There's also Awa that has just spoken. Uh, that uh, that is going also to say something. I'm not sure if uh, Professor Pierre Marie is connected, but if he's connected, please manifest yourself. And there's going to be a presentation that is going to be presented by uh, our colleagues from WHO, Dr. Uwe Drago. I'm going to introduce him in a few, and Dr. Chilanga. <clears throat> so before giving the floor to Anna, uh, I would like to introduce uh, briefly, Anna works uh, in the World Health Organization at the headquarters in, in Geneva. Anna is uh, actually leading a good uh, number of activities and initiatives. Uh, for example, the capacity building uh, as far as research is concerned and even as far as leadership is concerned. And that's in the Department of Sexual and Reproductive Health and Research and Human Rights. And it's the same department that implements the program. The program uh, as far as uh, human reproduction is concerned. Anna manages uh, uh, that program, human uh, reproductive uh, program, and she also manages uh, other initiatives, especially the work that is uh, linked to the quality of research, uh, where she where she she is a member of that team. She is also co-lead a good number of initiatives as far as SRHR is concerned, and especially in emergency and outbreak situations, especially as far as research is concerned. She has more than 20 years of experience in research. She worked on HIV AIDS, on sexual and reproductive health uh, and rights. She also worked on uh, epidemics such as Ebola, and COVID-19, and also she worked also on TB, and she's also interested in gender issues, in the health system that need to be strengthened, and also for the development of various methods and implementation research in, uh, in countries, uh, how can I say it, in uh, developing countries. Anna is a medical doctor and she has a specialization in uh, infectious disease medicine. 
and uh, she has a focus on uh, on epidemiology of infectious disease and also HIV AIDS. So he, briefly in a nutshell, that's uh, how I can introduce Anna to you. And now I will give the floor to Anna for her welcoming remarks. Thank you so much for, for that uh, <clears throat> introduction. I, I notice I can't start my video, so I guess that's uh, the idea to save bandwidth perhaps. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm very, very happy and, and proud to be invited to start off this webinar series related to the Global Early Adolescent Study. So thank you so much to, to uh, the organizers and uh, also for this beautiful introduction. Thank you, Anna. You can now share for your video, you, please. <clears throat> I can share my video now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Now, uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to just say a couple of words as an introduction related to, to uh, where I work and, and where also my colleague, uh, Dr. Chandra works, who's been uh, instrumental to the development of, of this program with us. So we are with the Human Reproduction Program. And this program is hosted by the w, uh, WHO, the World Health Organization's Department of Sexual and Reproductive Health and Research. We are a co-sponsored program, and it's important to mention that the UNDP, the UNFPA, the UNICEF are all co-sponsors of our activities. This year, our program is 50 years old, and we are celebrating that. And, and I think that having that, this webinar is, is really a great uh, part of that year-long celebration where we are uh, lifting forward various aspects of our work lead, related to sexual and reproductive health and rights and research capacity strengthening. So our uh, HRP program is the only body in the United Nations which has a mandate to carry out research on sexual and reproductive health and rights. Furthermore, we have a very clear mandate to conduct research capacity strengthening. And it's even been said in, at the start of, of the program that for every dollar spent on research, one dollar should be spent on research capacity strengthening amongst institutions and, and countries that need it. We convey research capacity strengthening through the HFP Alliance, which is our network for working with our partners that all contribute in various ways to research capacity strengthening. Included in our HRP Alliance and, and at the center of it are our HRP Alliance hubs. These are, are excellent and strong institutions situated in each of the WHO regions or sub-regions. And they are helping us and, and supporting us to operationalize the whole principles of, of uh, research capacity strengthening together with institutions in their respective areas. So the APHRC, uh, which is uh, co-leading this webinar and, and this uh, program uh, to share the knowledge from the Global Early Adolescent Study, is an HRP Alliance hub. The Nairobi office uh, has uh, contributed significantly by organizing the English webinars and now are taking the step to also work with these uh, Francophone uh, webinars uh, to this respect. We're very happy about this collaboration and, and look forward to also through this webinar to uh, find some new uh, partners to network with and, and to welcome you to the HRP Alliance, where we focus on research capacity strengthening within sexual and reproductive health and rights. We are very happy to see that this is conducted in French. And here I would like to make a quick apology uh, for my own English. Uh, my French is, is not well enough to bear through this uh, webinar and, and to keep your, your uh, sort of patience working, maybe next time. But we are incredibly happy that this is organized in French and that we have Francophone participants in this webinar. Uh, and like I mentioned, we really hope to, to uh, connect and, and to make new ties to, to these institutions and individuals who are participating. The Global Early Adolescent Study started in 
2010 already when HRP convened an expert group meeting to formulate a set of research priorities on SRH or very young adolescents in low and middle income countries. Through that uh, convened expert group, uh, 10 priorities were identified, which included items related to research, development, policies and programs. And one study that happened through these recommendations is the Global Early Adolescent Study, which is a collaboration between HRP, our program, and the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. The objectives of the GEIS are to understand how social constructions of gender inform health and well being across the adolescent years, and how this process unfolds in different geographic, cultural, and economic contexts to test how gender transformative interventions in early adolescents contribute to improving adolescents' health and well-being over time. Over the last 10 years, the GAS study has really been successful and has contributed to systematic review reports, the development of indicators and tools, and the publication of a number of journal papers and reports. So the purpose of this set of seminars, starting here in this webinar series in, in the Francophone part, of, of the Sub-Saharan African region, is to share the methods and tools that have emerged through this study and to build capacity on how to use them. It is also to share the findings of the study and their implications. We hope very much that this capacity building and sharing will contribute to the stronger research and action on building equitable norms in young adolescents in Francophone Africa and across the world. And with those words, I'd like to wish you the best of luck for this webinar series. Uh, I hope uh, this will uh, uh, end with a lot of spin-off uh, new studies using these tools and a lot of new connections and, and contacts made uh, for us to, to see this um, uh, research also expand to, to other settings. Thank you so much for this chance to, to welcome you all to this webinar. Uh, wishing you the best for the rest of the day. Thank you. Merci, Anna, pour, uh, Thank you very much, uh, Anna, for, for this introduction uh, that actually starting us off uh, and that is linked to, to everything that we are going to do in this uh, series of webinars. So now, uh, maybe I didn't introduce myself. I just took the floor like that because we started a bit later. My name is uh, Simplice Mbolambasi. I am a medical doctor. I work in the regional office for WHO in Brazzaville, and I'm in charge of uh, the uh, health of adolescents and youth in the school setting. So without uh, uh, wasting any time, I would like to give the floor to our uh, so that uh, she can uh, give us a brief update uh, as far as our research centers on the population and the health in Africa. And then uh, after our, I'll give the floor to the representative um, of uh, CSPAC. Uh, if uh, the professor or the regional director is connected, he's going to take the floor. If he's not uh, connected, his representative will take the floor. So to you, the floor hour. Thank you very much, Simplice. Uh, very fast. I'll start my presentation. There's, there's too much noise. There's too much noise for our. Dear colleague, if you are not having the floor, please switch off your microphone and uh, those who have their cameras on, uh, you can uh, uh, switch them off for the meantime. Awa, you have the floor. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, uh, we can see your screen, we can hear you. Go ahead. So very fast, uh, I'm going to do a presentation of uh, this uh, 
uh, what we're going to do about uh, this webinar. So first of all, uh, I can tell you that we have um, a regional Pan-African institution of research. It's a Pan-African uh, institution that was actually established in 1995. It was actually a program to give scholarship for the uh, Population Council and the registration was done in Kenya in 2001. So the headquarters is in Nairobi. And then in 2018, we also did uh, registration in uh, Senegal, and we have the regional office that covers the West African uh, region of Africa. Uh, and I can tell you that it's a multidisciplinary team that has uh, more than 150 African universities. In terms of vision, uh, APHRC is there to transform the lives in uh, Africa uh, uh, and all that because of research for mission, we want to generate uh, qui mène des thèmes de recherche très, très variés afin d'aider les décideurs à prendre and uh, basically when we want to take decisions we need to uh, support uh, all these decisions with uh, some uh, data and the second uh, department it's actually the capacity building for research where we where our team has uh, partnerships with universities so that they can really uh, strengthen uh, uh, the capacities of researchers in Africa so that they can do a good work and so that we can really have a good impact and to improve also the scientific education in Africa. The third department is actually uh, political engagement engagement and communication and that uh, will transform everything about research and so that we can uh, translate it into policy briefs uh, etc so here i'm going to give you a brief of the various uh, progr program divisions uh, the first division with the the six units we have the first uh, uh, unit aging and development and the second one education and youth empowerment we have also health and systems for health and population dynamics and srhr we also have uh, maternal and child well-being and we also have another unit for urbanization and the well-being in Africa. Monitoring. So all these units are actually monitored by uh, this uh, department. And like I told you, we also have a, a division of research capacity strengthening, and we have uh, partnerships with universities, and they are interested in uh, higher education research. Uh, and we also have uh, various uh, training program and scholarships. And we also have a communication department is interested in everything that is linked to communication, like uh, uh, policy engagement and knowledge management. And here you have just, uh, uh, you can see where AP APHRC operates. And we have uh, the two offices in Nairobi and Dakar. In green, you have the different countries in which uh, we have uh, research activities. In yellow, we have countries where uh, APHRC has uh, activities of capacity building and research. And the black ones show those the countries where we have activities as far as communication and research are concerned. So very fast, that's what I wanted to share with you. And I would like to thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Back to Simplice. Thank you very much, Awa, for this uh, brief uh, presentation. Uh, very rich in information. Now we'd like to give the floor to Professor Tebe, if he's connected. If is not connected, maybe its representative can take the floor. Is uh, Prof Tebe connected? Good morning, good morning, everyone. Yes, you are going to represent Prof Tebe. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you all. It's with a great interest that I would like to join uh, this panel. Uh, 
uh, to debate um, on this uh, theme, this uh, very important aspect as far as uh, uh, sexual health of the adolescents and also reproductive health of adolescents. So CSPAC, like you've asked, CSPAC is actually an interstate center for uh, higher education in uh, Central Africa. So the CSPAC is based in Brazzaville, in the Republic of Congo. So CSPAC, uh, like uh, uh, you followed, uh, it's an establishment for higher education. And uh, actually we have also teachings for masters for now. And we are in a dynamic, uh, uh, to move towards uh, uh, the PhD, but for now we are still uh, uh, at the master level. Uh, CSPAC uh, was established in 1980 and uh, the activities were stopped in Congo. Uh, I think it was in, um, in uh, 1997 because of the events that we we known in the country military events. And then the CISPAC, we started with uh, teaching for the masters, uh, learning for the masters in 2016. So masters in public health in CISPAC uh, uh, will take uh, about two years. And uh, uh, when you need to enter there, we're going to study your file. And for the masters, uh, the masters has four uh, divisions. The first one, it's uh, management of establishment and uh, health services, where we train the staff uh, to manage uh, and the health centers. The second uh, unit uh, is linked to the management for the program uh, in the fight against epidemics. Uh, in brackets, we want to talk about epidemiology, but I can tell you that this unit is in that unit. Uh, uh, through our referential that uh, we can find uh, the program of uh, sexual health uh, at all levels for adolescents, uh, even for, uh, even for, I would say, including the adolescents. You know that our reference is uh, dynamic, so regularly we have uh, revision for our portfolio and uh, uh, what uh, Professor Tebe asked me to uh, uh, tell you is that uh, because I've seen that you have training programs, you have masters and PhD program in, uh, in that field. So in the future, uh, if we could actually uh, have some exchanges uh, uh, about uh, these various uh, uh, curriculum as far as uh, adolescent uh, health is concerned. We have another specialty that is uh, uh, linked to the promotion of the health. And the fourth uh, unit of our masters is about uh, uh, the water environment and the quality of various food products. We are in partnership with uh, um, the public health institution of Rennes in France that actually help us in the development of uh, these uh, various uh, uh, courses as far uh, curriculum as far as uh, this uh, program is concerned. And I know that in 2023, we'll have something that will be concrete. So those are the various specialties of the masters of CESPAC. But apart from that, the CSPAC also organizes uh, some uh, uh, university diploma with uh, varied uh, uh, courses. And uh, at this very moment, uh, there's something that is happening with the initiation of research in health sector. And we are also thinking to put in place some uh, courses uh, for the, the team that we are actually seeing for this uh, webinar. And I do believe that our partnership uh, with uh, APHRC <coughs> will be very useful uh, because you know that CSPAC is regional and it regroups uh, the six countries of the CIMAC zone. Uh, but you'll be very uh, surprised that our students uh, are not just from the six countries of these uh, zones, but we have other people that come from uh, everywhere in Africa. We have Burkina Faso, Mali, Guinea, ETC, all these other countries that are not part of the CIMAC. 
I think that I've responded to your concern, but I'm still available if you have other concerns. We are together. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Sylvain, for this brief presentation of the CSPAC. Uh, during the discussions, if the colleagues that are connected, if you need more information about the CSPAC, do not hesitate to ask Sylvain. And now I would like to give the floor to Dr. Chilanga that is going to make a presentation with Dr. Wedrago. Allow me to introduce them very fast. I will start with Dr. Chilanga. Dr. Chilanga, who's a regional advisor in sexual and reproductive health and rights, work in the, in the uh, universal uh, health cover uh, based in Ouagadougou. Uh, Dr. Chilanga, like I said, he is a regional advisor and he brings uh, technical support uh, to a good number of countries, uh, namely in West Africa and in Central Africa, and especially for for everything touching sexual and reproductive health and human rights. And uh, uh, he also support in the formulation of the implementation, basically for monitoring and evaluation, and at the same time uh, for the reporting uh, or that concerns the various strategies and national strategies and national plan as far as sexual and productive health and rights are concerned. He also gives some support to strengthen our partnership, to strengthen the work as a network, and also to strengthen the capacity of the countries. And at the same time, to make sure that the countries can mobilize their resources, external resources and internal resources. So in that field, he has an experience for more than 15 years. And uh, when he had, the opportunity, he had the opportunity to work with a good numbers of organizations like Save the Children, Elizabeth de Glazier, a Pediatric Health Foundation, UNFPA, uh, IPPF, uh, the regional uh, office for Africa. So Dr. Chilanga uh, has worked in various organizations, various institutions. Like I said, he's a medical doctor and he has a master's in uh, medical anthropology. So for Dr. Wedrago, that is going to make a presentation with Dr. Chilanga. Dr. Wedrago is a medical doctor, is a gynecologist, he has a master's in public health, and he also has a PhD in uh, uh, sexual and reproductive health. He is actually a regional advisor uh, based in Brazzaville. Dr. Wedrago brings uh, technical support and also strategic support to all uh, the 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 countries uh, that is in the WHO region of uh, Africa. And he also brings uh, the development and uh, implementation of policies, strategies, and national plans uh, as far as uh, sexual and reproductive health and human rights are concerned. He also strengthens the, he builds the capacities of the countries uh, uh, for the implementation of monitoring and evaluation of all the initiatives, all the programs as far as sexual and reproductive health is concerned. He also coordinates a big team and some colleagues are actually based here in Brazzaville and others are based in various other countries. And that team that team works to strengthen the capacities of the countries as far as sexual and productive health is concerned. Uh, even though the sexual and productive health is a uh, cross uh, uh, 
cross-cutting uh, uh, domain. Uh, he works in various uh, program at the level of the regional office and even with the headquarters, and he works also with various partners. So he works in collaboration with uh, different uh, uh, programs within uh, in within the organization. He has more than 20 years of experience in strengthening reproductive health programs in the African region. So that's what I can say briefly uh, about uh, these uh, two eminent colleagues. And one is based in Ouagadougou and the other one is based in uh, Brazzaville. So without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Chilanga that is going to present the first part of the presentation. And the second part is going to be presented by um, Dr. Leopold that uh, will also close this presentation that uh, will touch on gender and sexual and reproductive health and uh, rights of adolescents. Dr. Chilanga, Dr. Wedrago, you have the floor. Okay, merci bien, Simplice. Pour, uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Simplice, uh, for this introduction. I hope that you can see my screen of uh, for my presentation very well like it was announced by simplice we are going to do uh, this uh, presentation uh, with my colleague dr chilanga so dr chilanga is going to do the first part and we are going to talk about uh, the issue of uh, sexual and reproductive health of adolescents in the african region and uh, it will be completed by my intervention that we talk about uh, the socialization or gender aspects for adolescents so uh, thank you and chilanga you have the floor Merci beaucoup, uh... Uh, thank you very much, uh, Leopold, uh, Simplice, and all the colleagues. I'm very happy to have been given that opportunity to be part of this webinar. And I would like to thank all the participants uh, that are here with us. Like it was mentioned, I'm going to start uh, with a presentation on the situation. Background about the situation of the sexual and productive health of the adolescents in the region. And then my colleague is going to continue uh, to talk about the gender aspect. Next slide. Okay. Next slide. Next slide, please. So for the background, we know that the health status of the adolescent, as far as the age group is concerned, I can tell you that the improvement is very uh, slow. And when we talk about uh, health policies and the, the health world really ignore the adolescent. And we say that uh, more than 1 million adolescents uh, die every year and for causes that can be avoided. And I can tell you, adolescents, it's not just a period uh, uh, for, uh, it's not just a period for physical change or sexual and cerebral change, but it's also a situation, a period that uh, is linked to the formation of the beliefs of attitudes. Uh, and that's why also the various attitudes uh, and also the behavior linked to the gender uh, are developed and can have an effect uh, uh, in life and especially as far as sexual and reproductive health is concerned. Next slide. So we are going to continue with the background or the context. When we see here is the access and the control of resources and uh, power dynamic constitute uh, uh, root causes of inequalities uh, between the gender and they are actually uh, among the uh, social determinants uh, as far as uh, the health uh, issues are concerned. So among all the, the death of those uh, Adolescents, we can talk about HIV AIDS, accidents, maternal troubles, and also the main factors of risk and the well-being as far as health is concerned. So the period of adolescence is actually a second window of opportunities to actually uh, leverage on the previous investment or even to change behavior. And these elements 
ask us to put some emphasis on gender as far uh, when we talk about the health issues for the adolescents in the various policies programs as far as the sexual and reproductive health is concerned next slide so when we look about the main problems as far as uh, SRHR for the adolescents in our region, when we can see here is that uh, more than 31% of the women that are aged 20 to 24 years in the African region have been married before the age of 18. And there's a high rate of uh, uh, birth uh, of these uh, adolescents that are giving birth. And I can tell you that the African region has the uh, very high or heavy load of uh, morbidities as far as HIV is concerned, and more than one uh, million new infections in 2018, and a greater proportion of adolescents that are uh, infected or affected. And there's also a high rate of uh, sexual violence or gender-based violence. So all that shows uh, that uh, there's a great link with uh, gender issues that we're going to see in the other slides. Next slide. When we look at the prevalence of contraception in for the girls age 15 to 19 years, what we see is a, a low level on the left we can see in the African region. Uh, we have uh, this, uh, 17 percent and when we see the level the mean the average is 17 percent but when you see the level uh for most of the countries majority of the countries is actually uh lower than the average and uh, on the other side you can see that uh, uh for the girls uh, 15 to 19 years the average is still low in the african region next slide at the same time, uh, this is linked uh, to the percentage of uh, teenagers that have started uh, having uh, children. Uh, that was in 2018. Uh, we can see here that the percentage, uh, the regional level is very high. It's, uh, the average is at 25%, and most of the countries have a percentage that, uh, of the girls that have uh, gotten uh, children that is even a level that is um, higher than the regional average, and we, it can even reach to 50% when you look at the example of Mozambique. Next slide. And uh, that's uh, another slide that shows uh, uh, that a good number of uh, girls and uh, uh, women that are married as children in uh, West and Central Africa. And here we, in total, we talk about uh, almost uh, uh, 60 million. And when we talk about countries per countries, when you see a number of girls that are married when they are young, uh, the rate is very high. When you look at West and Central Africa, next slide, the percentage of the girls age uh, 20 to 24 years that were married or that uh, got married before the age of 15 or even before the age of 18 in West and Central Africa. That's another slide that shows all this information. And that's a level that is very high. When you look at uh, the West and Central Africa and when we see uh, everything that is happening country per country. Next slide. So the level of uh, giving birth uh, for the One, uh, teenagers, for that's for 20, 2004 to 2020, the information that we have here, uh, there's a reduction year per year, but you can still see that the level is very high even if uh, we have a good, uh, uh, good improvement, uh, but it shows that we still have some work to do so that we can have a good reduction of that uh, phenomenon. And uh, when we are all uh, facing this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, it also has a great impact in the life of the uh, teenagers. Uh, many, clo uh, uh, many, clo uh, many schools have been closed and they couldn't continue with their studies and they couldn't actually benefit from the services in the school. And parents maybe have stopped working and uh, it will change many things for the young girls in the family dynamics. And I can tell you that health agents that uh, 
are actually concerned by these uh, COVID issues do not have uh, maybe all the equipment, equipment so that they can really work in all security. And adolescents can also, uh, they, they may not be able to go to the health centers uh, because the restriction of movement. And at the same time, it can be caused uh, by uh, many things that are linked to COVID-19. So all that uh, has impacted the services to the teenagers during this uh, COVID period. So I'm going to give you some examples of the African countries. The first example in Ethiopia, uh, the, uh, where you can see here, it's um, source is Guchmaka 2021. Uh, COVID-19 actually, uh, actually increased many things. We had uh, uh, unwanted uh, pregnancy uh, in for the teenagers. Uh, we have more than uh, uh, 250,000 USD uh, for the health system in Ethiopia uh, to, to, to work on this uh, health system that are linked to the pregnancy and also for the newborn. We also have 438 adolescents with complications uh, when giving birth. And that's for Ethiopia. Next slide. There are some data that we had uh, for the young people in the, the, the region in uh, Southern Africa. And uh, we have more than 90% of the young people that responded to that. Uh, that aspect and they say that uh, the access to the health uh, uh, care have been affected because of COVID and three respondents out of five uh, talked about access to the SRHR services and sometimes they abuse drugs and other substances and many things have increased because of uh, the lockdowns and I can tell you also that uh, Many um, many chains uh, that were there to help in SRHR have been disturbed. C'est non désiré dans la sous-région. Next, des recherches ont 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 été faites et je donne deux exemples des études des recherches qui étaient faites au Kenya, Afrique du Sud. Ce qu'on voit, les adolescents des écoles secondaires qui ont été déscolarisés. Pendant six mois, en raison de confinement lié à la COVID au Kenya, étaient deux fois plus susceptibles de tomber enceinte et trois fois plus susceptibles d'abandonner l'école que celles qui avaient obtenu leur diplôme juste avant la pandémie. Alors, on voit déjà des changements avant et après le, la pandémie. En Afrique du Sud, une autre étude dans cinq provinces a montré que la grossesse chez l'adolescent a augmenté 60% depuis euh, le début de la pandémie. Alors, c'est des recherches qui montrent ces changements et l'impact à la santé des adolescents. Next. Et la région africaine est plus en plus hein, confrontée à des situations d'urgence humanitaire. Et dans ces, dans ces situations, la santé sexuelle et reproductive des adolescents est hypothéquée est, est avec un nombre accru de violences basées sur le genre, bah, violences sexistes, de besoins non couverts en contraception, de grossesses non désirées et d'avortements à risque. Next. Et c'est aussi très important euh, de voir et de comprendre que euh, l'égalité le, des genres est très importante pour l'attente de tous les 17 euh, Objectif de développement durable, ce qu'on voit et les recherches montrent que c'est plus les femmes que les, les hommes qui sont impactés économiquement. C'est eux, c'est les femmes qui vivent plus dans les situations de pauvreté, y compris les femmes adolescentes. Et les recherches montrent que si on peut améliorer la situation économique des femmes, ça peut assurer euh, amélioration de côté éducation nutrition et de la santé des femmes et toute la famille en général. Alors, avec cet aperçu de situation de santé sexuelle et reproductive des adolescents dans notre région, je vais laisser la parole à mon collègue 
Dr. Leopold de Drago, qui pourra continuer pour nous mieux montrer le lien avec le dynamique genre. Merci beaucoup. Ok, merci bien, Dr. Chilanga. Donc, euh, nous allons poursuivre avec les facteurs qui influencent donc, la socialisation de genre pendant l'adolescence. Comme nous l'avons déjà vu avec les diapos précédentes, euh, l'adolescence par elle-même constitue donc euh, une période à haut risque. C'est pour cela que les adolescents sont euh, classés parmi donc, les populations à risque en raison de leur vulnérabilité qui s'exprime donc à plusieurs niveaux. Et, et, et nous allons euh, voir maintenant qu'en en fait, euh, il y a plusieurs facteurs qui vont interagir à des niveaux différents, aussi bien sur le plan transversal que sur le plan horizontal, pour euh, déterminer, influencer la socialisation de genre, qui vont donc euh, influencer ou déterminer euh, le futur de l'adolescent. Et déjà, il faut euh, dire que la socialisation de genre est un processus. C'est un processus euh, dynamique, donc par lequel les individus développent, affinent, apprennent et internalisent les normes et les rôles de genre en interagissant donc avec les principaux agents de socialisation tels que leur famille, premier cercle de socialisation, les réseaux sociaux hein, qui prennent de plus en plus d'importance fondamentale dans la socialisation et d'autres institutions sociales qui existent également. Donc, il s'agit fondamentalement d'un processus important à la période de l'adolescence dont il faut véritablement tenir compte et sur lesquels il faut pouvoir travailler pour avoir donc une influence positive sur euh, la socialisation des gens donc de l'adolescent. Et ce processus donc de socialisation des gens est lié au développement des capacités cognitives et à la maturation sexuelle des enfants et des adolescents qui sont donc à leur tour influencés par divers agents de socialisation et des facteurs contextuels. Donc, l'adolescent, l'enfant et l'adolescent dans ce milieu est subi l'influence des facteurs intrinsèques, mais également des facteurs extrinsèques, bref, donc de tout son environnement, qui vont donc façonner et influencer donc le développement de genre à son niveau. Et il est important également de noter que les années de pré-adolescence adolescence et d'adolescence sont donc des périodes critiques pour la socialisation, ou la sensibilité aux normes sociales et aux influences des pères, y compris donc celles liées au genre, est très aiguë. Donc c'est vraiment une étape capitale et c'est pour cela qu'il est important d'y veiller pour s'assurer que tout se déroule de la meilleure manière possible et éviter donc les influences négatives, notamment dans la période pré-adolescence, la période adolescence, il faut s'assurer que il n'y a pas d'influence négative qui vont mal conditionner donc la socialisation de genre de l'adolescent. Et alors, ces facteurs multiniveaux euh, 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 qui influencent la socialisation donc de genre pendant l'adolescence, comme je l'ai dit, se situent à, au niveau horizontal, mais également au niveau vertical. Et il est important donc de, euh, de comprendre cette socialisation -là liée au genre et qui nécessite donc une connaissance approfondie de l'interaction entre l'individu et son environnement, puisque finalement, c'est l'environnement qui va Léo, on t'entend plus, je ne sais pas si les autres collègues t'entendent. Je ne l'entends pas non plus. Simplice, euh, euh, moi aussi, je ne peux pas entendre. Langa, petits... est-ce que tu peux continuer? Il, il doit avoir des petits soucis de connexion. Qu'on lui donne euh, 30 secondes, une minute. Simplice, Léo, tu es connecté. Si Langa peut continuer, si Léopold rejoint. Oh, euh, désolé. Euh, ah, il est là. Ah, je ne sais pas ce qui s'est passé. Vous m'entendez maintenant mieux? Oui, 
Est-ce que la slide est visible? Non, pas encore. Ah, ok, une seconde. Je crois qu'il y a eu un problème de connexion. Donc, je refais ça. Est-ce que c'est visible maintenant? Oui. Enfin, de mon côté, c'est visible. Oui. Oui, okay. moi aussi. OK, excellent. Donc, alors, j'ai présenté ce cadre multiniveau qui, comme vous l'avez dit, euh, euh, s'étale aussi bien au niveau vertical qu'au niveau horizontal. Et reprenons tous les facteurs hein, euh, aux différents niveaux qui influencent et qui vont conditionner donc, la socialisation de genre et aboutit donc au niveau résultat outcome que nous avons. Donc, complètement à droite, vous avez les résultats attendus en termes de outcome, donc euh, qui va tenir compte des différences de genre en matière d'éducation, euh, de participation euh, au niveau social, au niveau politique, etc. Et y compris les éléments en rapport à la violence basée sur le genre, tout cela va tenir compte de ce qui est à gauche. Et ce qui est à gauche, donc, c'est de tous les facteurs qui interviennent, aussi bien au niveau individuel en bas, au milieu, au niveau euh, interactionnel et au niveau structurel plus haut. Le niveau structurel s'intéressant beaucoup plus donc au niveau euh, socio-économique, conditions socio-économiques, euh, le niveau euh, patriarcal, genre, le niveau politique structurel et, et même le niveau euh, social structurel, y compris la race, la classe sociale, etc. Et les médias, sans oublier les médias, au niveau global. Tout cela a une influence sur le développement des gens, donc de l'adolescent. Et au milieu du niveau social, interactionnel, comme on le dit, c'est essentiellement les influences des parents, de la famille, de façon, disons, au, plus, au sens le plus large du terme. Et les institutions sociales, y compris les écoles, les groupes religieux, euh, les réseaux sociaux, euh, l'interaction, l'influence des pères. Hein, les médias au niveau local, même le voisinage, tout cela donc a une influence sur pas, la socialisation des gens et, et bien sûr le, au niveau individuel, on a les facteurs biologiques, les différences sexuelles, euh, les différences physiques, etc., euh, et la personnalité, etc., qui vont donc influencer également la socialisation donc, des gens. Donc voilà euh, globalement tous, ces, tous les facteurs qui interviennent hein, de façon... Euh, imbriqué dans la socialisation de genre et sur lesquels il faut donc travailler afin d'obtenir une influence positive pour conditionner donc le développement, euh, la socialisation de genre donc de, de l'adolescent. Alors, les, comme je le disais, juste pour revenir sur certains éléments assez importants, il y a le rôle que jouent les parents et la famille. Euh, C'est vraiment important et il faut insister beaucoup sur l'influence positive que le cercle familial doit pouvoir jouer dans la socialisation de genre à tous les niveaux. Et ce, depuis la petite enfance jusqu'au niveau de l'adolescence, il faut faire beaucoup attention à cela, y compris euh, la division du travail au sein de la famille, hein, le type d'exposition aux médias, la connaissance d'exposition aux normes sociales, les stéréotypes liés au sexe, tout cela a une importance fondamentale. Et je pense que c est, c est, c est, ça, ça, ça se passe de, 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 de commentaires. Quand dans une famille, on voit qu'il n'y a que la maman qui fait tel, tel type d'acte, par exemple, ou tel type de travail, ben, automatiquement, on est évident, il est évident que ça va conditionner hein, le développement donc, de, de l'enfant, de l'adolescent dans, dans ce sens-là. C'est un peu ces, ces éléments qu'il faut euh, prendre en compte et arriver à une influence positive donc, sur le développement et, euh, de l'adolescent. Et la nature du lien parent-enfant hein, qui évolue à l'adolescence permet aux jeunes de devenir plus indépendants et autonomes quant à leurs opinions et leurs croyances et également d'accroître leur capacité à prendre des décisions de manière indépendante. Ça, c'est également important. Il faut voir comment travailler et cela de façon progressive, donner confiance à, à l'enfant, à l'adolescent, au fur et à mesure que euh, cet adolescent grandit en âge et donc est amené à prendre progressivement des responsabilités. Et euh, cela est important surtout dans le contexte actuel où les parents et les enfants ont de moins en moins le temps de passer 
passe le moins de moins de temps ensemble. Et si bien que très souvent, les enfants, les adolescents sont abandonnés aux réseaux sociaux, à la rue hein, et, et, et tout ce qu'il y a autour, qui souvent justement ne donne pas le meilleur exemple possible pour un développement harmonieux de l'adolescent. Donc, c'est vraiment important que les parents et la famille retrouvent leur rôle fondamental dans la socialisation donc, des adolescents. Alors, les pères, c'est un élément important également. On a beaucoup parlé de l'éducation par les pères. Il faut savoir que cela est effectivement important. Les pères jouent un rôle fondamental dans le développement des capacités socio-cognitives et émotionnelles de euh, la préadolescence et de l'adolescence. Et il faut donc, euh, en dehors, et il faut savoir en tenir compte parce que les adolescents, les jeunes enfants sont attirés par des amitiés donc liées au père en dehors de l'immédiateté de la famille. Donc, en dehors de la famille, pour ceux qui suivent, ce sont les pères, que ce soit à l'école, euh, dans le voisinage, dans les euh, milieux sociaux. Voilà les pères qui vont influencer le développement donc, euh, euh, social de l'adolescent. Et donc, il faut également tenir compte et faire en sorte que cet environnement dans lequel grandit l'enfant puisse être le plus sain possible pour qu'il puisse avoir des influences positives. Donc, savoir que les pères deviennent une source importante d'interaction et d'apprentissage sexué et l'engagement dans des activités spécifiques telles que le sport sert à façonner des identités sexuées. Alors, quelques résultats liés au genre de l'évaluation des obstacles à la santé des adolescents en Éthiopie, au Nigeria et en Tanzanie. C'est donc... Des, des, des études qui ont été réalisées par euh, le bureau général de l'OMS Afro et, et Simplice est là, il pourra certainement vous en dire plus puisqu'il était au devant de, de cette évaluation. Il y a des résultats intéressants hein, dans l'ensemble de ces pays qui ont bénéficié de cette évaluation. On a trouvé que les adolescentes manquent de pouvoir de décision dans leur ensemble, manquent de pouvoir en matière d'accès et de contrôle des ressources y compris pour leur propre service de santé sexuelle ou reproductive, en particulier dans les zones rurales. Ça, c'est vraiment important et il faut donc qu'on puisse s'organiser pour répondre à ce manque-là. Également, on voit que les adolescents manquent de pouvoir pour négocier, par exemple, l'utilisation des préservatifs. Ce sont des éléments qui sont ressortis également et, et c'est important de prendre cela en compte et voir comment on peut y remédier. Et on voit également euh, que les adolescents euh, sont moins susceptibles d'avoir accès à l'argent pour payer les services, surtout en milieu rural. Et il y a notamment euh, le faible niveau de connaissance en matière de santé qui a également été mis en évidence par euh, ces études-là. Souvent, on pense que c'est évident, mais ce n'est pas trivial. Il y a des lacunes en matière de connaissance, donc euh, connaissance sur la santé sexuelle et reproductive. Donc, il y a des efforts à faire pour vraiment apporter l'information euh, là où il le faut pour que les jeunes les adolescents puissent vraiment être informés suffisamment de, euh, de tout ce qu'il faut pour la santé sexuelle et reproductive et de comment prévenir certaines pratiques à risque. Et, et les études ont également mis en œuvre, mis en évidence la stigmatisation et les idées fausses qui empêchent les adolescents donc euh, enceintes de rechercher des services de santé sexuelle et reproductive, notamment des services de contraception et de santé maternelle. Donc, c'est encore des faits qui sont d'actualité et c'est une stigmatisation, surtout pour ce concernant des adolescents enceintes. Et il y a des idées fausses et tous ces éléments-là ces éléments -là empêchent les adolescents d'avoir accès aux services qui leur sont euh, dédiés. Et c'est effectivement très dommage et euh, cela concourt, c'est dommage de le dire, mais c'est un fait, concourt à augmenter les risques d'avortements clandestins, des avortements à risque que nous rencontrons toujours dans nos différents pays et qui, en réalité, représentent finalement une des causes majeures des décès maternels dans la région africaine, ce qui est vraiment euh, déplorable à ce niveau-là. Tout cela parce qu'il y a une stigmatisation et les adolescentes enceintes sont abandonnées à elles-mêmes et ne savent pas où rechercher les services appropriés et finalement se retrouvent entre les mains donc, des, 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 des avorteurs, comme on le dit, euh, des quartiers périphériques, dans des conditions que nous connaissons tous très déplorables. 
Alors, pour ce qui concerne les adolescents de sexe masculin, dont les garçons, euh, il y a également des faits qui ont été relevés par ces études-là. C'est que les normes de genre, telles que la masculinité, empêchent le contact et l'utilisation des services de santé, les discussions, c'est l'utilisation correcte et régulière du préservatif. Donc, c'est comme si finalement, les garçons sont plus ou moins euh, mis de côté. On n'a pas, ils ne se sentent pas beaucoup euh, approchés par les services de SR. Et le deuxième euh, point vient euh, confirmer cela, c'est que les garçons hein, sont même très souvent convaincus que les services de SR sont réservés aux filles. Donc, du coup, on pense que euh, les, les garçons ont les informations qu'il faut, mais non, ils n'ont pas les informations qu'il faut et en fait, ils ne savent pas où aller également parce que beaucoup ont la conviction que les services de SR sont des services qui sont destinés aux filles et donc les garçons n'ont rien à chercher dans ce service de SR. Donc, ce sont des éléments sur lesquels nous devons travailler également. Et ceux qui ont une expérience vécue de la rue se voient souvent refuser l'accès aux établissements de santé, aux cliniques et aux services de SR. C'est également ressorti parce que très souvent, même les prestataires ne sont pas suffisamment informés et n'ont pas toute l'approche qu'il faut pour accueillir donc les adolescents dans les services. Il y a également le rôle des, des, des partenaires, les pères, hein, les pères qui deviennent une source importante d'interaction et d'apprentissage sexuel et l'engagement des activités spécifiques telles que le sport sert à façonner les identités sexuelles. Donc les garçons ont beaucoup plus recours aux pères, à la père éducation euh, pour donc se concentrer des activités de santé reproductive. Alors, euh, après un tour d'horizon sur les facteurs multiniveaux qui influencent la socialisation des genre pendant l'adolescence, euh, quelles sont les interventions programmatiques clés que nous pouvons recommander pour influencer la socialisation des genre et la santé des adolescents? Il faut dire que ces interventions sont basées sur un cadre socio-écologique qui tente donc de rassembler les principaux facteurs qui influencent le processus de socialisation des genre et ses résultats. Il y a plusieurs niveaux. Il y a le niveau individuel, les interventions au niveau communautaire, euh, au niveau programmatique, au niveau structurel. D'abord, au niveau individuel, il est très important de noter que les adolescents et les prestateurs de soins de santé euh, génétiques ont un rôle à jouer dans la lutte contre les stéréotypes négatifs, les diverses normes, rôles et relations inégalitaires entre les filles et les garçons. Il faut essayer de briser euh, ce tabou-là. Et au niveau individuel également, il faut s'attaquer aux attitudes sexistes. Au niveau individuel, généralement dans le but de modifier la dynamique de pouvoir entre les sexes de façon plus générale. Et il y a les attitudes des prestataires de soins de santé qu'il faut également travailler. Il faut les modifier par des formations efficaces à la prestation de services adaptés aux adolescents. Donc c'est vraiment important que euh, cela soit également pris en compte, que les prestataires soient plus réceptifs, plus accueillants envers donc les adolescents. Et au niveau communautaire, il faut que la communauté également puisse jouer un rôle. Et pour cela, il faut renforcer les capacités de, de la communauté par l'éducation et la mobilisation des masses pour des engagements de protection et d'autonomisation des adolescentes. C'est extrêmement important que les adolescentes ne se sentent pas abandonnées à elles-mêmes, ne se sentent pas rejetées, surtout lorsqu'elles sont enceintes, mais qu'il y ait un accompagnement, une acceptation, une intégration dans la communauté pour que cela puisse se faire de la meilleure manière possible. Alors, au niveau des programmes, il y a qu'il faut également travailler à l'analyse obligatoire du genre. Ça, c'est extrêmement important pour pouvoir identifier les questions contextuelles liées au genre et servir de base pour des interventions et des projets de santé sexuelle et reproductive afin de garantir un accès universel. C'est extrêmement important donc de euh, pouvoir euh, euh, traiter de ces questions contextuelles il faut donner aux jeunes des informations, des compétences et un soutien, des services adaptés aux jeunes. Il faut introduire donc les jeunes dans la manière dont le genre est construit dans la société et leur donner les moyens d'adopter et de défendre les rôles et les relations de genre alternatifs et plus égalitaires. Se concentrer directement sur le changement des attitudes et des croyances des jeunes, c'est vraiment important. Il faut leur donner les moyens de remettre en question les normes de genre établies par le biais d'une formation sur le genre. Il faut que les jeunes eux-mêmes soient formés, soient capacités pour pouvoir euh, s'identifier dans la société euh, de, façon, euh, de, de, de façon optimale. Et je pense que c'est également important de pouvoir intégrer des interventions en faveur des personnes handicapées dans tous les domaines du programme ciblant les adolescents. 
très souvent, c'est un volet que nous tendons à oublier, la prise en compte des personnes handicapées dans toutes nos interventions hein, et, et, et surtout qui concerne dans les adolescents, il faut savoir également en tenir compte. Alors, au niveau structurel, c'est les politiques et les programmes actuels, il faut pouvoir les évaluer et voir s'ils si sont vraiment adaptés aux adolescents et s'ils tiennent compte de la dimension de genre et s'il y a lieu, les mettre à jour. C'est extrêmement important. Il faut renforcer les systèmes nationaux en mettant l'accent sur l'amélioration de l'accès des groupes défavorisés, notamment les jeunes, les pauvres en milieu urbain, les communautés rurales, les populations autochtones, les personnes handicapées, et s'attaquer à l'inégalité entre les sexes, la violence sexiste, la discrimination fondée sur le sexe par le biais donc d'intervention d'autonomisation des adolescents. C'est extrêmement important, y compris par le développement donc socio-économique. Alors, quelques opportunités pour finir. Il y a, il y a quand même un mouvement d'ensemble au niveau mondial, au niveau régional, en faveur donc de, 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 de la socialisation des gens. Et euh, il faut déjà commencer par le développement du RAP, mettre un accent particulier sur cela. Le protocole de Maputo, qui est également d'actualité, et la conférence donc, de la population de développement, ACD plus 25 de Nairobi, qui a également remis euh, sur la table ces notions fondamentales de socialisation de genre et d'habilitation donc des adolescents. Il y a euh, les 16 jours d'activisme que nous connaissons certainement tous contre la violence basée sur le genre, qui est célébré donc euh, chaque année du 25 novembre jusqu'au 10 décembre, date de la journée donc, des droits humains. Et ces 16 jours d'activisme contre la violence basée sur le genre représentent en fait un cadre stratégique aux personnes et aux organisations du monde entier qui appelle à l'action pour prévenir et éliminer la violence à l'égard des femmes et des filles. Et cette année, enfin l'année passée, 2021, euh, le thème c'était bien sûr « Oranger le monde, mettre fin dès maintenant à la violence à l'égard des femmes ». Il y a également la conférence des hommes de l'Union africaine sur la masculinité positive, la leadership pour éliminer la violence contre les femmes et les filles. C'est juste un rappel parce que cela a eu lieu euh, récemment, et c'était une conférence inaugurale de l'Union africaine et qui a donc repositionné donc le thème là, des hommes leaders africains qui font la promotion des apports de masculinité positive pour mettre fin au fléau de la violence contre les femmes et les filles en Afrique. Et alors, pour finir, quelques messages clés, c'est que il faut une volonté forte de veiller pour veiller à ce que les adolescents ne soient pas laissés pour compte dans le contexte des OBDD. Et il y a une nécessité d'apporter une attention particulière à leur santé sexuelle et reproductive, réitérée dans la liste des actions clés pour la mise en œuvre du programme d'action de la Conférence internationale sur la population et le développement lors du sommet de Nairobi. Il y a une urgence de s'occuper de la santé sexuelle et reproductive des adolescents en Afrique subsaharienne hein, afin de briser les inégalités flagrantes qui existent avec d'autres régions du monde. Et on sait tous que les données, les tendances au niveau national, au niveau régional, cachent des disparités et il, y a, il faut travailler à rendre équitable l'accès aux services de santé sexuelle dans tous les pays de l'Afrique subsaharienne. Et je crois que cela est extrêmement important d'avoir des données désagrégées qui soient analysées présenter et utiliser tel quel pour l'appui de décision. C'est vraiment l'important de donner des agrégés et nous y travaillons tous actuellement au niveau donc régional hein, avec euh, Simplice et les autres collègues pour que cela puisse donc aider à l'appui de décision. Voilà, je m'arrête là sur ces messages clés. Merci pour votre attention. Merci, euh, Chalanga. Euh, merci, euh, Léopold. Merci euh, tous les collègues qui, qui ont fait des présentations. Je veux faire un bref euh, euh, résumé euh, rapidement de tout ce qui a été dit. Et comme ça, euh, on va ouvrir euh, la session questions et réponses. Alors, brièvement, on a vu que euh, euh, l'OMS, au niveau du siège, à travers son programme, son programme sur... Euh, la reproduction humaine euh, euh, conduit un certain nombre de recherches euh, en partenariat avec plusieurs institutions au niveau global 
Et ces recherches euh, euh, visent à générer des évidences, à renforcer les, les capacités euh, des partenaires, les capacités euh, des pays. Et ceci, euh, ceci a un accent sur euh, 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 les jeunes adolescents, ce que je pourrais appeler la première euh, adolescence. Donc, euh, 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 le siège à travers ce programme qui est logé au niveau du département de la santé sexuelle et reproductive et de sexual and reproductive health department works in collaboration with several partners and we also have uh, several UN agencies as far as a research center on uh, Well, we have a pan Africanism, which is a APHRC that was created in 1995. The mission is to generate data and build the countries and the partners' capacities in terms of research. The headquarters is in Kenya, as it was said. We have a regional office that is based in Dakar. When it comes to CSPAC, uh, it is a regional institution of uh, public uh, health uh, whose senior members organize several programs uh, and uh, it leads uh, to a master's degree. The institution also delivers university degrees, uh, especially on research. Uh, and uh, therefore, this institution would also like to be involved in the area of sexual and reproductive health, especially the adolescent area. As far as gender and sexual and reproductive health is concerned, especially for adolescents, when it comes to the context, we have data that shows that more than one million adolescents die in to HIV AIDS, road accidents, maternal problems, as well as uh, mental problems. Therefore, here we need to consider the gender problem among adolescents because gender, uh, we in Africa, we have the problem of early marriages. We have uh, the unwanted pregnancies I've just spoken about, HIV AIDS, which is among the major causes of mortality with a very high rate. We also have sexual violence and that has a link with gender dimension. We have also seen that adolescents have a problem of access to services. And therefore, this means uh, that uh, the prevalence uh, remains. Uh, therefore, we have uh, major disparities in the country. The, the, I've talked about uh, child marriage, which constitute a major problem in the society with a very high percentage compared to other regions of the world. And therefore, Oh, therefore, therefore, we have the, therefore, we have, when we compare with other regions of the world, we see that in Africa, the situation is worse. We have the impact of COVID-19 that uh, it was in this situation, and uh, there were schools that were closed, and this led to weak access to services and the parents were also were also reluctant to take the children to sexual uh, sexual and productive uh, health services and another problem that is emerging during the pandemic was the abusive use of 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 drugs Chilanga shared with us a certain number of studies that were carried out and the results in Kenya and in South Africa. And this showed that during the pandemic, there was a high risk of pregnancies. 
and I, it was very, very high because we are still uh, with the pandemic uh, and uh, this, uh, therefore, this uh, leads uh, to unsecure abortions and uh, this is one of the causes of morbidity and mortality. Therefore, why gender, why is gender equality an important aspect? This is because uh, if we improve the social economic conditions of women, this will reduce their vulnerability and this will allow them to contribute to the contribution of their families, community and respective countries. We have not that at this level, we have multi-level factors that influence socialization during the adolescent period. Therefore, what are the agents? We have family social networks, intrinsic and extrinsic factors. We also have reluctance and uh, through peers, uh, we have individuals who also uh, who are also influenced. Therefore, we have uh, horizontal and vertical issues, and therefore we need to understand the direction of every adolescent with his or her environment and understand the factors that influence social gender socialization. Therefore, we have the, you have to begin with the family circles and understand the link between the parent and children and, and you can therefore strengthen the capacity of adolescents so that they can take informed decisions and involve the peers. We talked about uh, the results and the uh, obstacles that are linked to the obstacles of, uh, I mean, there were evaluations that were carried out in a certain number of countries, and this revealed that uh, adolescents had uh, a problem of uh, decision-making and negotiation power. We have uh, social economic barriers, especially in rural areas. We have a lack of knowledge in the SRH issues, discrimination, as well as stigmatization. All this can lead to a certain number of problems, especially unsecure abortions. In our context, studies revealed that girls are forgotten in all this because they do not benefit from SRH services. Therefore, to correspond to all this, what are the recommended interventions to have a positive influence of gender socialization? You need to act at several levels. At the individual level, we have two actors here. We have the adolescents and the, and the service providers themselves. We also to need to act at the community level by building the community's capacity so that uh, they so that they can uh, use services. We have the programmatic level so that we can respond to the specific needs at the social structure level by adapting policies and programs. Given all this, we need to take into account of global, regional, and national opportunities by adapting to the priorities and context. But in order to 
take uh, good decisions. So we need to develop uh, programs and policies and research that take into account uh, the needs of the adolescents and let it take into account uh, the adolescent problems. And uh, therefore, you need to generate data. And therefore, we are working in this uh, direction so that uh, data may be available. This is what I can share with you in terms of a summary as far as the presentations you followed are concerned. Therefore, on this, I would like to open the session of questions and answers. If you would like to take the floor, raise your hand, or you can share your question on the chat. Have the floor. So please, and uh, my friends, we are uh, almost at the end of the webinar. Can we? Uh, on peut répondre à vos questions. Mais je veux seulement dire que. But I would just like to say that uh, today we have uh, begun with a, a series of three webinars. We still have two. The second one will be on the third. And uh, the third one will be on 30th of March. Therefore, during the second and the third webinar, we have uh, we have uh, set aside 50% of the time to discuss today. Was just presenting of the context. Six articles clear for you in français, and immediately after this webinar, we will share these articles. Et troisième chose, euh, euh, j'ai vu que beaucoup de, il y a beaucoup de félicitations à Chilanga et Leopold, et ils vont partager. Chilanga et uh, Leopold, they are also going to share their, their, their slides and you can use them. Sam, please, you have the floor. Yes, merci, uh, Shanga. Thank you, Shanga. The uh, participants, we take note of the fact that uh, the webinar has taken uh, some time, but we can take five to 10 minutes uh, to respond to some questions if you have uh, questions uh, for the participants uh, or two of the speakers who have spoken. You can also share your question through the chat, as I said, or you can raise your hand and we shall give you the floor. I can see participants asking that we share presentations. Hello. Quels sont ceux qui ont levé la main? Merci beaucoup pour uh, merci beaucoup merci beaucoup pour ces présentations intéressantes. I can just say thank you so much. We have uh, Gideon Gamba and Kamara. Kamara, you have the floor. Cher Kamara, vous avez la parole. Kamara, you have the floor. Please uh, use your microphone. Activate it. Who is the next one, Sandra? Gideon Ngamba. Ngamba, Gideon. Good evening, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the trainers. Who did a good uh, presentation, which uh, we followed with a lot of interest. I would like to thank them a lot for the brilliant presentation. The point about the multi-level factors that influence gender selection during adolescence. We talked about socialization as a process. 
we talked about the impact of environment on gender development. But according to me, I did not understand or see clearly what we want, what we mean by multi-level factors that influence gender relation during adolescence. I was expecting to see a certain number of factors. Maybe I'm not seeing well. Maybe I need more explanation. Thank you very much. Before I give the floor to Leopold, there's another question. Thank you very much for this presentation. I would like to understand the strategy, the education strategy through peer educators, which was abandoned and yet is the one that is most preferred by adolescents. Therefore, can this uh, be revised? Therefore, the Paul and Chinanga, you can take these uh, first two questions. Thank you very much, uh, Sam. Please. And I would like to thank the participants uh, for questioning questions. It shows that uh, the presentation are interesting. It's uh, interesting to see this uh, kind of interest. And thank you for comments. We have uh, noted question. several issues. We have questions of interest that uh, we have the presentation so that uh, we can have questions on multiple factors. Uh, I don't know if you can see the presentation. Leopold is the uh, end of the slideshow to, to uh, oh. change the diapositive. Ah bon? Oui, nous ne voyons plus les, les, la diapo. Anna we can see the slide. Donc, je vais mettre stop share et puis je repars alors. Ok, bref, voilà. Donc, c'était pour dire que... Uh, I was saying that there are a certain number... Okay. Okay. Donc, alors, il y a ces éléments là. You uh, can see the elements. We say multi level because we have the horizontal and vertical level. I don't know if you can see the green arrow that shows the horizontal level as well as the factors that contribute as well as the vertical level. These are the in, in influence level. Since we don't have time, we shall not go into details. But to explain, this uh, flow is uh, demonstrative because you can see on the left is the influence level. We have it in England of the French version. We have uh, the influence which I have uh, the structural level, which is the highest level compared to other levels, because we have the national, supranational levels. The middle, these are factors. When we talk about the first level, we have supranational national, and we have the social economic context. We have the gender context. We have patriarchal societies, and we also have the political and policy level, and you also have the social structures like the social class, the race, and all that is a level that is very high and secure, and therefore the media, the global level, therefore so this is a level, and therefore this has a, an important influence on gender socialization among the adolescents. Therefore, we have this level at the supranational level. And therefore, when we look at the interreactional, we have the different level. We have interaction at the family level between the parent and child. We have the education structures like schools, religious groups. We have social groups like peers we have talked about, local media. 
even the neighborhoods are some of the elements and below we have the individual level we talked about biological factors uh, sexual maturation physical maturation personality which is the lowest level therefore this is what you can say therefore the therefore these are the different levels and at every level we can see the vertical level and we have the different factors we have continued on the right therefore we have the structure level these conditions the opportunities and the structures including the labor division in the society and uh, this will have an influence on the elements uh, on the, uh, at the vertical level especially at the education level and, uh, this will uh, therefore Therefore, we need to look at the gender identity. Therefore, when we go on other sides, we have different elements. Uh, and, uh, this will condition gender based violence as well as attitudes and even beliefs. Donc, voilà globalement tous les facteurs qui interviennent dans la. These are some of the factors that influence gender selection, and uh, we have a different level. And as I said, we need to know at what level we need. Uh, we need, uh, therefore, to work. Uh, and uh, what we also need uh, to have more positive influence uh, during each one of these uh, levels so that we can uh, have an influence. Uh. Yeah, merci. Uh, uh, thank you very much. The second question is also linked to that. The issue of their educators will come. It's not negative. The peer education it needs to be well framed. We need, therefore, to know that there appear influences, and we need to know that the peers have the competencies of know-how and knowledge so that they can have, therefore, all this environment needs to be looked at so that uh, the peer education is uh, profitable. Adolescents. Therefore, there are studies that have been done and they show that this has not always been the case. Therefore, what we need to say is that uh, we need to pay attention so that uh, we do not uh, encourage the peer education negatively. We need to make sure that uh, conditions are uh, therefore uh, uh, take place in uh, good conditions. And that's why we have peers uh, as a part of the important factors uh, that uh, therefore we need, therefore, to look at it at the optimal level. Therefore, therefore, this is what we need to take care of. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leopold. I think that we shall end this webinar that was very rich in, in information. Excuse me, some please, Suleiman would like to say something. Maybe we can end with a response by one of our colleagues. 
Suleiman shall be the last person to ask a question. Suleiman. Suleiman Atua. Suleiman, you have the floor. Suleiman, on t'entend pas. We are not getting you. Je ne sais pas pourquoi il est parti. Maybe bon. Suleiman has left. Les collègues qui ont des, des commentaires, des questions, vous. vous collègues with comments, uh, questions, uh, you can put them in the chat. On, on va, on va, pas, on va pas suivre. Uh, we shall look at your et contributions. And all the questions that uh, were not uh, responded. What I would like to say before I end is that we talked about a series of webinars. Today was the first webinar, and we still have two. I think that the second one shall take place on uh, 23rd and the last one on 30th. Therefore, this is a well coordinated for APA. Therefore, therefore, we shall have therefore more information that we shall that we shall avail to you. If there are no questions, I would like to thank all the colleagues and the organizers. I would like to thank Chandra. I would like to thank uh, other colleagues who took time to participate. I know that we have some of our colleagues in East Africa. It's uh, about uh, nine o'clock, but since the team was very important for them, they took time to connect. I would like to thank everyone and wish you a nice evening and uh, see you soon. We shall uh, still be together and uh, we hope that, uh, that uh, we shall see you again. Therefore, we shall be together on 23rd. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Peter Ahmed Chilanga. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Merci.